why are you growing canola in your gardens? Canola is so bad. So let me try to explain this. What's up, Lazy Dog fam? Hope all y'all are having a phenomenal day. It is Wednesday, September 27th here in South Georgia. And believe it or not, we are already planning where we're gonna put things for our spring garden, even though that's six or seven months away. So on today's video, I wanna catch you up on some of our soil building exercises we've got going on around here. See if our fall garden plot is ready. Talk about how we're planning so far ahead for spring, why we do that. And then we're gonna get some cool season cover crops planted. So first, let's start off by giving you a little update on some of these warm season cover crops that we have going on. We've got several different stages of growth. So I'll show you what we've got. So in this little 20 by 35, 20 by 40 plot, we've got a custom warm season cocktail we made with sorghum sedan grass, sunflowers, and red ripper peas. You can see some of those peas there. Most of what you see out here is sorghum sedan grass. I might have planted that a little too thick. I don't know that some of those sunflowers and peas in the middle are gonna be able to climb up through that stuff because it's planted so thick. But we like to plant it thick because when it's planted thick like this, not nary a weed can thrive. Now, in addition to all the wonderful benefits of cover crops that we mentioned on the videos when we were planting all these, there's also an ancillary benefit, and that is cover crops will kind of tell you what's going on with your soil, kind of tell you what your nutrient levels are, if you've got any hot spots in a particular plot. Yes, we can get a soil test done, and that will tell us about our phosphorus and potassium, some of our micronutrients, but a soil test doesn't really tell you anything about nitrogen. These cover crops will, however, tell you if you've got any nitrogen hot spots in your plots. So if we just quickly browse over this cover crop plot, we can see there are some areas that look taller and greener, some areas look shorter and a little more pale. Now this nice green growth we're seeing here on the middle edge is pretty easy to explain. Right here is where I always set my tripod sprinkler. Those things do okay, but they're not the most even watering systems out there. So this little patch right here has been getting a lot more water than the ends of the plot over there where you can see it's a good bit shorter. Then we've also got a couple more patches of greener, better looking growth kind of right down the center of this plot. So you can see a little green spot right there. And over there you can see a really tall, nice looking green spot. If we recall what we had planted here prior to this cover crop, we had two giant pumpkin plants in here, just two plants. We had them running right down the center of this plot, right where you can see that dark green growth and we were fertilizing those pumpkins like crazy. So that's why we're seeing what we're seeing here. So this cover crop is telling us that besides those few little hot spots there, this plot is not very fertile. Now we kind of already knew that. This is our sandiest plot we have. Doesn't hold nutrients very well and tends to be the least fertile. But if we didn't already know that, this is a perfect example of how cover crops can tell you what's going on in your soil. If this soil was really fertile, all that sorghum sedan grass would be dark green and lush. But we've got a lot of it out there that's kind of pale, which tells us that our nutrient load isn't that high. And that's why when we were talking about getting skunked on our sweet potatoes last week, I said this plot here would probably be perfect for sweet potatoes because we don't have to worry about super high fertility in this plot. Now moving on from this cover crop to right over here where we had our pumpkins and butternut squash in the spring and summer months and then a couple weeks ago we planted a cover crop of white millet here and I really like what I'm seeing. Got really good germination, getting some really good soil coverage there. And surprisingly, even though we were broadcasting this by hand, I was able to throw a pretty decent straight line there. I just knew I was going to have millet popping up all in our turmeric there, but it looks like I maintained a pretty decent little edge. 
So we're gonna let that millet rock and roll until it gets killed by the first frost, usually in late November, early December. I don't think we'll have to worry about it going to seed before then. Things have cooled off a good bit here lately. So hopefully it just grows and grows and gives us as much biomass as possible. Now moving on from that millet cover crop to right over here, where our girls are almost finished with the soybeans. So we can see several different stages of growth or termination in this plot. This little patch right here that looks relatively clean is one that we wheel hoed several videos ago. Probably need to wheel hoe that one more time and maybe we'll get some fall transplants in the ground this week. This over here needs a little bit of cleanup, needs a pass or two with the wheel hoe. But if it's anything like that over there was, shouldn't take long at all to get it ready. And then right here we have what's left of this soybean cover crop and we can see there starting to get some little bitty soybeans on some of those plants. Now unlike most of the time where we move the chicken tractor every day, on this plot I've been moving them every other day and that's mainly because I wanted a portion of the plot to be ready for fall planting sooner than later because we have some transplants in the greenhouse that are ready to go. So leaving them on a spot for two days lets them wear it out a little bit more, helps them terminate that cover crop a little faster. And you can see where they were yesterday before I moved them right there. They've worked on that pretty good. And in this case, since we do want the girls to tear up and terminate this cover crop pretty fast, I have been doing something a little differently as far as my feeding strategy goes. So when I move them to a new spot like we did yesterday, they get put on you know lush spot of soybeans like we see right here. They eat those soybean leaves, eat those soybeans. And then the second day, so this afternoon, I'll come out here with not a lot, about a mason jar full of layer pellets, and I'll just throw it all around inside that chicken tractor there on the ground. And what that does is encourages them to kind of scratch around a little more, and it helps terminate that cover crop a little bit faster. So we don't always feed them with layer pellets when they're grazing like this, but because I wanted this plot ready faster, I gave them a little bit or have been given a little bit to encourage a little more tillage by the girls. So in a couple more days, they'll turn the corner there, come back down this last little lane, and they'll be done with this plot in about 10 days. Once they're done here, I think, We'll take them right over there to those sweet potatoes. So this is that patch of Orlean sweet potatoes that we got skunked on. We showed y'all that last week. We had a lot of people suggesting that I just leave them here a little longer and see if they eventually size up and get unstringy. So I figured we'd give them at least a week or so to do that. We'll check them again. I don't think they're gonna get any better. That's why I'm gonna turn the chickens loose in here. Still have those cow peas over there. We'll be waiting on those to produce. But while we're waiting on that, might as well let the chickens tear up these sweet potato leaves here. By the time they're done working on this, those peas may be done and we can let the chickens kind of work over the rest of this plot. That way we get some nice even fertilizer distribution. So this plot's already pretty fertile, but it's about to get even more fertile if we graze those sweet potatoes with the chicken tractor. And I think that's why this plot is gonna be the perfect spot for our sweet corn next spring. So I do like to try to plan ahead with my grazing and my cover crop systems and all that and think about where I'm gonna put stuff next spring. If I'm planting something that's fairly demanding like sweet corn, I'd rather plant that in a spot or a plot that has been grazed versus one that hasn't. Got a nice fertile plot here, gonna get even more fertile and it'll be perfect for sweet corn. So the plan is, whenever the chickens finish on the soybeans, they're gonna go over there to those sweet potatoes. We'll eventually let them work over that entire plot, get some nice even fertilizer distribution. Then I want them to graze this plot. Obviously there's nothing there to graze right now. That's why we gotta get something planted today. So October is a great time to plant cool season cover crops here in South Georgia. We're not quite in October yet, but we're close enough. And like I said earlier, it's pretty cool this week. So I think we'll be okay. 
So these cool season cover crops are exactly what the name implies. They'll grow throughout the fall and winter months down here. They can tolerate a light frost. Sometimes if we get a really, really hard freeze, it may knock them back a little bit, but they usually recover and keep growing. So last year we planted a couple different cool season cover crop mixes from green cover seed. And the one I liked the most was called the overwintering mix. It had rye, wheat or barley, can't remember which one clover vetch peas and rapeseed in it and it was a pretty good mix it grew well for us the chickens really liked grazing it didn't have to feed them any layer pellets while they were grazing that stuff but for my liking it had a little too much rye and wheat or barley in it which the chickens don't eat as well and that rye can be a lot harder to terminate than some of the other components of that mix as a result this year we're gonna kind of make our own overwintering mix. We're gonna exclude the rye, wheat, slash barley kind of cover crops. So I've got a box here with some different things to make our own mix. Let's see what we got. Right here we've got our rape seeds. I think I've got five pounds of that. Here we've got our hairy vetch, winter warrior hairy vetch. And this is our clover, frosty bursine clover. It's a great clover, I've grown that one before. And then lastly, we've got our Austrian winter peas. So the vetch, the winter peas, and the clover are all nitrogen fixers, which means they'll fix atmospheric nitrogen, add it to the soil. The vetch and the winter peas don't grow back quite as well after grazing compared to the clover, but they're still nice components to have in the mix. And this frosty bursine clover is a really good clover, makes a really dense mat over the soil. And this one is really, really cold hardy. I know a lot of people are used to planting crimson clover or Dixie red clover and nothing wrong with those, but there are some improved clover varieties out there. Bursine being one of those. There's also one called Balanza clover. So I would highly recommend giving Bursine or Balanza a try versus the crimson, I think you'll find you like it a little better. And then we have the rape seed here, which is one of the components of that overwintering mix that the chickens seem to like the most. So I definitely wanted to have more rape seed in my mix compared to what was in that overwintering mix that we used last year. Now, anytime we talk about growing rape seed, we always get a few people that start screaming, why are you growing canola in your gardens? Canola is so bad. So. Let me try to explain this. Rapeseed is like the heirloom OG canola. At some point, people realized that rapeseed wasn't a very marketable word, understandably. So they changed the name to canola, eventually came out with a GMO variant of it. This is not the same thing as the GMO canola that is grown for the oil that you buy in the grocery stores. This is actually something that a lot of organic farmers use for biofumigation. And if you recall that interview we did with Jim Garrettson at Wood Prairie Farm back earlier this year or late last year, he talked about how they grow rapeseed and incorporate it into the soil as a biofumigation tool, much like we've done the mustard in the past. Now, as you saw with that sorghum, sunflower, and pea plot, I'm not that great at getting the ratios right on these custom cocktails we make. I do know I've got five pounds of each component here, and I want 10 pounds total, so I'm gonna just eyeball it. Hopefully, we'll get it close to right. So we're gonna use about half this bag of peas, and then about half this bag of hairy vetch. And then for the rapeseed and the clover, the seeds are a lot smaller, so I don't think we need half a bag. It may just go about, I don't know, a quarter or a third of the bag. So now we just mix it around here a little bit. I didn't inoculate those peas because the clover is pre-inoculated, and I thought, well, maybe that's just enough inoculant to go around. Hopefully it is. Just want to get a nice little consistency going here that way when we throw this stuff we're throwing a little bit of each component now we just need to broadcast that seed over this 30 by 35 plot came out here earlier this morning got it tilled up ready to go once we throw the seed we'll rake it in all right so we got our seed down got it smoothed over with the landscape rake we'll put some water on this tonight 
we should be able to get it up and going pretty quick. Now keep in mind here that our cool season cover crop mix is specifically designed for grazing with the chicken tractor and being able to withstand multiple rounds of grazing. Yes, all those components are going to do great things for our soil, but they also happen to be things that the chickens really like to eat. So if you make your own cool season cover crop mix, you may have different things in your mix than we have in our mix. You may like the rye in your mix. It does great things for the soil, makes a nice dense root mat over the soil. It just doesn't really work well for what we do. And if you're gonna be planting some cool season cover crops this fall, I would highly encourage you to go with diversity over just planting a single variety or single type of cool season cover crop. Going with diversity is a little tougher with the warm season cover crops because when it's hot outside, things go to seed faster and it's hard to kind of time it and group things together that are gonna kind of go to seed at the same time. With the cool season cover crops, it's a lot easier to plant a greater diversity of things because it's nice and cool. This stuff's not gonna really go to seed during the winter anyways, and we can add some nice diversity to the mix. So I hope you enjoyed the video today. Don't forget to check out our affiliate links and coupon codes in the description below. And also go check out our website, lazydogfarm.com. And if you want to see some of these cool season cover crops, just lush, beautiful covering the entire plot, check out this video right here, one that we did last year, showing that overwintering mix and showing how we grazed it with a chicken tractor. So check that out and we'll see you next time right here at Lazy Dog Farm.